This week has left us with questions as far as the eye can see. Some of the questions that we'll talk about tonight, will the Panthers actually make uh, history in futility? Uh, will uh, SMU become a sleeping giant? Is there any amount of NFL that we won't watch? And with two teams left in the College World Series, who you got? My name is Ed Smith, and this is Total Sports Talk Beyond the Lights. Welcome, everybody. This is Total Sports Beyond the Lights. My my name is Ed Smith. I'll be your host this evening. And with me tonight is David Street. What's up, y'all? Matthew is still out with his family this week. Uh, so once again, congratulations, and we will see him next time. Uh, David, I wanted to uh, jump right in and just talk about the NHL, the Stanley Cup Finals going on. Uh, <clears throat> Edmonton. They did not go the way of the Dallas Mavericks. Is there any chance that they could make history with uh, by going the complete opposite direction? Well, before we get into that, you know, for those of you, uh, for those of you who, who are watching, uh, obviously you probably know that the Stanley Cup, that Game Six of the Stanley Cup Finals, is going on right now. So anything we mention, any stats that we mention, are you know prior to the game. Uh, that is going on right now. So just keep that in mind. But yeah, and it's so funny because we all talked about how it really seemed like the um, the Celtics and the Panthers uh, essentially purposely lost uh, their respective game fours to uh, win their championships in front of their home fans. With the Celtics, that definitely seemed like it was the case um, because they beat the uh, Mavericks pretty handily. But with the Oilers, the Oilers and the Panthers... Dude, the Oilers are just, they've just been kicking the Panthers' ass lately, including right now. I mean, I think the last time we, uh, last time we checked, it was, uh, two nothing, uh, Oilers, and they were up on the shot count like 12 to three or something like that. Yeah. And <clears throat> it's taken a somewhat historic performance to get the Oilers back into this game. And guess what? That's exactly what we've gotten. They're, when it comes to hockey, there is the Gretzky record book, and then there's everybody else. Well, Connor McDavid is on a historic pace to maybe break into that record book that is held for the great one with a total of eight points in the last two games. It has just been amazing to watch the, the evolution of going from Gretzky's anticipation and vision of seeing the game happen as as it were whereas Connor he is much more physical he has more individual skills that are just so creative and to be able to use his teammates around him to create all these opportunities the Oilers like you said David they have been kicking tail over the past couple of games and <clears throat> As I mentioned, those record points, Gretzky had 47 points in 18 playoff games in 1988. Connor McDavid is at 42 going into this game. That is so close. And if they have any performance like they did uh, in game uh, four in Edmonton, that record's broken because that was the butt whipping of a lifetime that looked like Florida, like you said, wanted wanted to try and close it out at home. Well, the Oilers had other ideas. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, when you look at the Oilers team, I think they have the right mindset. Like, they're, they're basically approaching each game like just one game at a time. They're not, they're not approaching it like they're down 3-0, they're approaching uh, each game that they are able to play like they just have they have another game left to play. You know, 
it's very hard to uh, sweep teams, whether it's hockey or baseball, basketball, like any sport where you have the ability to do that. You know, it's very hard to uh, sweep. To, like, it's hard for teams that are up 3 nothing, and it's also obviously hard for teams that are that are down 3 nothing. Like, it's hard for a team that's up 3 nothing because the tendency at that point is to look ahead because you're thinking, oh, like, we're up 3 nothing. Um, we can already see the uh, prize at the end there. And you kind of have – you have a tendency to overlook your opponent just because you are so far ahead of them that you forget that you still need to win one, one more game. You still need to have that, that mindset, that, that focus. Um, but also when you're down three, nothing, then there's obviously a tendency to think, well, we're down three, nothing. Uh, this is, this is insurmountable. A lot of teams don't overcome three, nothing deficits. Um, so we're cooked, but no, whether you're up three nothing or you're down three nothing, you still have to play one more game. There is always at least one more game. And right now, Ed, the way that I look at it, the Panthers have been playing like they have the right to earn the, the next game because they just got one more one more game. That's it's right there. And the Oilers are approaching it with a with a different mindset. As I said, they're not approaching it like they're down three nothing or like they were down three nothing. They're just simply approaching it as, hey, we have a, we have another game to play, and if we win, we have another another game to play. Yeah, and what I find interesting is how it almost feels like the goalies both switch bodies. Oh my right, god! In the, right in this, <laughs> in this setup, because it's it gives a very Space Jam vibe where the Monstars took the talent from the NBA players. Well. Mm-hmm. Stuart Skinner has somehow taken the talent from Bobrovsky <laughs> and turned it around uh, because at this point, Bobrovsky, he has given up 12 goals in the last three games. Yeah. That is insane. Considering that just a week ago, we were talking about, oh, well, Bobrovsky is going to get the con Smythe and it's, you know, this is, there's no way that, uh, the Oilers come back from this because Bobrovsky won't let it happen. Well, in reverse, Stuart Skinner has over a 900 save percentage in the last two games, mm-hmm. and he is pitching a shutout at this point uh, in game six. Yeah. So that is amazing to me how quickly it turns. But when you're talking about a team sport like hockey, if one piece of the cog is malfunctioning a little bit, the rest of the product becomes a little bit less. And the Oilers are taking advantage of that as we speak. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're right. We, we did talk about Bobrovsky, um, that he should win the Conn Smythe Trophy. And, I, and back then, yes, he absolutely should have been the favorite. But I don't think he should be the favorite anymore. I still think he's obvious, he's obviously still a big reason for why the Panthers made it to the finals. And he will be a big reason for if or when the Panthers, um, you know, uh, w- w- uh, win the cup. Um, but he should not be the favorite anymore. Um, you may recall, Ed, I talked about my three criteria for who should win the Conn Smythe. And one of those cri- uh, criteria, criterion, yeah, cr- criterion, I think, was uh, you have to have the numbers. Well, at the time we talked about Bobrovsky being the favorite or that he should be the favorite to win the Conn Smythe. His save percentage was around 916. Now, that's not spectacular. That's not otherworldly, but it's solid. It's it's a solidly good save percentage, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, the last time I checked, his save percentage was 906, and obviously lower now. Um, you know, even or even if or when the Panthers win uh, the, uh, the clincher, you know, Bobrovsky's save percentage is still not going to be uh, that high. And listen, like no goalie is ever going to win the Conn Smythe with a save percentage, just barely hovering above 900. Like it's just not going to happen. Um, and listen, I've seen the argument for, for, for McDavid winning it. And, you know, I think that's a good argument. I don't think that's egregious. Um, you know, if the, if the Oilers lose, but McDavid still gets the MVP, um, since we would assume that he broke what Gretzky's record, or at least he's damn near close to it, um, I don't think it would be entirely egregious. But I, I still wouldn't necessarily, you know, a- agree with it because, you know, at the end of the day, you put up all those numbers, but you know, you didn't really help your team win, and it seems like it would be unfair to look at the team who actually did win 
but not uh, but not actually give you know reward any of those individual players for doing their part for leading the team. Now I know what you're going to say, or I know what you're, what you're thinking. You know, this is kind of uh, you know throwing it back to when we had our uh, debate about who should win the Heisman, Penix or a uh, or um, uh, Jaden, you know, Jaden Daniels. Um, you know, um, you know, you and Matthew thought that Penix or, or not, yeah, yeah, Penix should have won it, but I argue, I argued for Jaden Daniels. And the Heisman at the end of the day is about who's the best player, not necessarily who's the most valuable player. Well, the Con Smythe is not the best player in the in the uh, playoffs. It's who's the most valuable player. And if the Panthers win it, I think I would give the Con Smythe to uh, Alexander uh, Barkov. He's second on his team in points. Um, he's first in faceoff wins by you know by a pretty large amount. Uh, first in game-winning goals, which quite literally doesn't get more valuable than that. And he's also first in takeaways. So he's doing all the, all the little things to help his team win. So, again, if the Panthers win, but Connor McDavid gets the MVP anyway, I don't think it would be egregious, but I wouldn't agree with it. Oh, how little you think of me, Mr. And, yes, I understand that four or five uh, players won the Con Smythe uh, in, you know, in, in a losing effort. I don't know if that's what you were about to say, but I just wanted to get that out of the way. I am, I'm in the camp where if Florida wins this series, they escape with it. They didn't actually win it. Whereas if the Oilers win it, then they won this series. They took it from the Panthers. And that kind of leaves us in that, in that weird realm where uh, Jerry West won the MVP despite losing his team losing the NBA Finals in 69 to the Celtics. It's the only time it happened in NBA. Uh, you just mentioned a couple times uh, in the Stanley Cup playoffs where that could be the case. Well, when you see McDavid is only the second player to have a a point on half of his team's goals. That's that's definitely in that number category that you you certainly fall into. Uh, it definitely gives more credence to go ahead and give Connor McDavid that award. Just whatever the result is, whether it's the Panthers winning or the Oilers winning, just because he has been so far the best player and there's not really much debate about that i don't care what side you're on you can't look at this series the way that it sits now and think that there's any part of it that connor mcdavid is not the reason why it's up to game six at this point yeah so i'm i'm certain i certainly get where you're going with that but I feel like you're taking the same argument that Matthew and I had on the Heisman and applying it to the to hockey, whereas we're kind of taking your argument that you had on the Heisman and uh, bringing it to the NHL. Well, so yeah. the roles are kind of reversed on this. That is funny. But also in fairness, like the Heisman is the best player. It's not necessarily who the most valuable player is, whereas the Con Smythe – isn't necessarily the best, the best player, although 99.9% .9 of the time it does go to the best player, but the cons mind is who's the most, you know, valuable player in, in the playoffs. So I feel like I've been, I mean, I get where you're coming from, but I feel like I've been pretty consistent with, with my, uh, with my logic here. Yeah. I mean, in the end, it's a debate. We're on mm -hmm. opposite sides of it. So, and that's what we want to do. We want to have this talk. We want to have this chat. And if y'all watching, I want to put your thoughts in the comments. We would greatly appreciate that as well. You're wrong. Did... You were wrong. <laughs> no, you were wrong. You. Uh, one point I did want to bring up is the ratings on this series, despite it being so lopsided to begin with, mm -hmm. is up 31% over the same series last year mm -hmm. in the Stanley Cup Finals. Averaging 4.1 million viewers. Yeah. That is growth of a sport. And well, when you're putting out quality like the NHL is over what the NBA has been putting out, I I would rather watch hockey all day. 
Well, you know what? It, you, you know why? Um, you know, you know a big reason why uh, why we've seen such a big jump, Ed, because last year neither team had Connor McDavid. You know, Connor McDavid yeah. is the difference maker. Yeah, and just like when you have the best player, people want to watch him. Mm-hmm. When you don't have the the best player in the league on your screen and available to watch, you're not going to watch it. It's yeah. it's simple math uh, when it comes to that, which is the same argument that we've made for the WNBA and any of those leagues that are wondering why there's, they're not getting paid. Well, guess what? You put the most, the most visible and the person that people most want to see on your screen and people are going to watch. And this series is part of the proof in the pudding. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, yeah, I mean, like I, you know, obviously, you know, we're both, uh, we're, neither of us are in agreement about, about McDavid and whatnot, but at the end of the day, as I said, um, if he does win the con, the, uh, con Smythe, um, even a losing effort, I don't think it'll be uh, egregious at all. I mean, he's certainly, uh, he's certainly putting up the numbers for it. Oh, definitely. Definitely. And you know, as if things g- keep going the way that they've been going the last two games, we'll see the Oilers win and this will be kind of a moot point. Yeah. I, I do want to bring up just one more point, Ed, before we go on to a, a different topic. Um, but if the Panthers do lose it, um, if, if they do lose the finals, just think of, I, I want to know, like, as far as Bobrovsky, I mean, where do they go from here? I mean, Bobrovsky is in his mid to late, in, in his mid to late thirties. You know, he doesn't have a lot in the tank. He doesn't have a lot, a lot left in the tank. Although in fairness, you know, I think there have been goalies who who, who have still been able to play at a very high level, uh, mm-hmm. even going into their late 30s or early 40s. So I don't want to, you know, close the lid on Bob just yet. Um, but, you know, this will be the second – this would be the second year in a row um, that Bob was not able to lead his team to the finals. And, yeah, it's not over for him yet, but time is running out now at this point. Yeah, just like – uh, any aging athlete, you got to start wondering what's the threshold. Where where do you start making that that conversation happen? When does that conversation become action? And when you have a goalie that he's done well enough up to that point, and he just hasn't gotten you over the top, is that somebody that you are going to continue to work with and be a core port? a core part of your team or are you going to take a look around and go, well, maybe this isn't the right guy. I don't know. Yeah. If we're going to relate this same conversation to uh, any other correlations, it's the same conversation that the Packers had about Aaron Rodgers. is yes, he's getting older. Yes, he's still very good at what he does, but is he going to be the guy that gets you to the Super Bowl and win it? And that's the conversation that management has to have about any player that is getting up there in age, no matter how good they are. Yeah. Well, I have an update, by the way. Uh, Oilers are uh, up on the Panthers, 3-0. Yeah, this series is going back to sunrise. (laughs) Game seven, game seven, game seven. Greatest words in sports. Yep, we love it. Now, speaking of uh, of teams that are are wanting to be on your television more as you go forward uh, with uh, with their uh, seasons, we're going to switch gears and talk a little college football. It was recognized this week that SMU has raised $159 million in fundraising ahead of their move to the ACC. Why is that significant? Well, when you talk about blue blood programs, top tier programs that have all the money in the world, just as an example, Texas A&M, SMU have 
out fundraise Texas A&M by more than $40 million. This is a program that has not been relevant since they came back from the death penalty. And, and I'm not saying that they haven't been to bowl games and won a lot of games for their program, but they have not been on the national scale. They have not been part of a power four conference since that time. And this is, this is going to be money that's realized to go directly into the program right away, as opposed to waiting uh, for a few years to get a full share because they're not asking for any money from the ACC. They just want to be a part of it. And what kind of, David, I'm going to ask you, uh, what, what kind of future do you see for a program that can fundraise like this, get facilities like they are talking about building and being in the ACC as opposed to being into a conference like the Big Ten or the SEC? Well, Ed, what I see is a bright future. And forgive me for jumping the gun here because you're, you're probably going to ask us ask us soon, but I just want to go ahead and talk, and talk about it now. But you look at SMU, and you have to think that they are absolutely a sleeping giant in college football. I mean, they're obviously in a power five, well, power four now, power four conference, right? Um, we've uh, we've talked about how they have the financial capabilities um, to you know to uh, be competitive. But ultimately, what help what helps them the most, Ed, is they are in a recruiting hotbed. You know, we we talk about the states that have the best, yes, the best high school football in the country. You know, states like Florida, California. Uh, Texas. In fact, the Dallas, Texas area, which is where SMU is located, has some of the best high school football in the country as, you know, as far as the teams and the, and the individuals go. Yes. And it's a area that relishes in its high school football so much so that they have stadiums for high school football that are larger than most division three or yes. even division two college teams. That is how much they love that love their high school football in that area, and it is an area that has that has been just barraged by college recruiters across the country, specifically Oklahoma and Texas, but you've also got TCU right there. You get your Alabamas and you get your Floridas and you get your Georgias and you get your Oregons all coming to the Dallas, Texas area looking for recruits because even if they don't get the five-star recruit, they will get quality four-star recruits and even quality three-star recruits out of that area because there is so much high school football in that area that they can basically field most of college football just on that, let alone still being in the same state as the Houston area, which is an ungodly amount of uh, quality uh, players out of that area as well. Yeah, so DJ. I'm uh, totally with you. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, Gators' uh, second string quarterback, DJ Lagway, uh, is from Willis, Texas. And Willis is in the Houston area, right, Ed? I believe so. Okay. Now, <clears throat> The, the, yeah, I mean, where, wherever it is, obviously the point is that Texas has some of the best, you know, high school football in the country. Yes, uh, they most certainly do. And like I was saying before, the University of Houston is actually in their second year gaining an amount of full media rights share from the Big 12. Well, SMU is so excited to be part of the Power Four that they completely negated taking any money from the ACC to make this jump. Why? Because they can now get those recruits that are leaving the area because they are they were not in the Power Four, Power Five at that point conferences. Uh, so they can now be recognized and will have more TV airtime. They will have more uh, scouting uh, scouting for possible NFL uh, projection. 
and everything that comes along with being in that top tier. Last year, they got $9 million from AAC for their media rights share. Well, the media rights share for the ACC, the secondary stuff, not the full media share, that's the same amount. So they're not losing anything on that end. What they are gaining is the exposure and the backing of what has traditionally been known as a country club kind of school. And uh, congrats to Bryson DeChambeau being from SMU, uh, who paid homage to Payne Stewart being from SMU uh, in the golf realm. Uh, But talking about talking in the football sense, this is putting them on the map. Uh, whereas the G5 has been kind of like a live tour and putting them on the PGA tour. This <laughs> is this is the big time. This is the big boy stuff. And that's what they're gunning for all along. So does SMU have uh, any high profile donors? Because it's, it's pretty unusual the amount of money that they've been able to raise, like even more than, than Texas A&M, as you had mentioned. So SMU... They have so many high dollar donors that there's none of them that are specifically high profile uh, that I can think of off the top of my head. There's just so many of them. Mm-hmm. It is it is traditionally known as the uh, the sweater neck uh, crowd, <laughs> the uh, the roll up in your Mercedes before NIL. Uh, type crowd. It's that type of school. And that's what's been projected. And they've leaned into it. They are known as a rich kid school. Well, well guess what? The rich kids are about to get richer uh, <laughs> with having more money funneled into the program with the amount of exposure that they're about to have in the Power Four Conference. Yeah, well, and you you know you did you did say that SMU is basically a country club school, which pretty much says all there is right there. Absolutely. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, but given the given the ACC climate right now, with all the turmoil with Florida State, and uh, I think it's North Carolina that's also suing uh, for that. That sounds with, about right. With that type of, uh turmoil going on in the in the ACC does a school like SMU provide some stability in your mind um I can't say they provide stability yet Uh, they can't provide stability yet um until we see some uh consistency as far as winning goes but I think they certainly have the uh potential to do that um but you know but even even if or when uh FSU in North Carolina leave I mean the ACC is not going to totally fall apart because I think the assumption would be at that point Clemson would uh, hold water for the conference that's true that's true um, and not just in uh, football we're also talking in baseball uh, mm-hmm. we're also talking in uh, basketball which you know we saw this week the ACC is a premier baseball league and if there's more emphasis put on the entire athletic program and not just the football side of it, then we could see more of those teams from SMU making an impact in the ACC landscape as a whole. Absolutely. But something else that is changing the landscape as a whole for the NFL is the fact that Hard Knocks is now going to be shown throughout an entire season and which begs the question is there any amount of football that we won't watch <laughs> when it comes to the NFL I don't um, think I've I don't think I've ever watched even a second or, or a clip of, of, of hard knocks um, other than like maybe commercials and, and ads but yeah sure it's an HBO show which you have to have your subscription there which at this point, if you look at the NFL, you have to have Peacock, you have to have HBO, you have to have Netflix, you have to have uh, Hulu, who the whole the whole <laughs> thing, and and then they've also got this uh, this 
a red zone uh, litigation going on as well. How much, how much football on different uh, platforms can they do? Amazon Prime? My goodness. I mean, you have to subscribe to 17 different services to get all the games. And it's uh, really just uh, difficult to keep up, if you will. But with but traditionally, Hard Knocks has been a preseason training camp going into the regular season type of show, which gives you more all access in the meetings and it, to players' lives and things of that nature. And the division that they are going to target for the end season is the AFC North. Now, why did they target the AFC North? Because it was the first division in a very long time to have all their teams finish with a winning record. And that is says tremendous things about that division. But as far as the teams being in it, the Ravens, this is their second appearance in Hard Knocks. The Bengals, it's their third appearance in Hard Knocks. Uh, the Browns, this will be their second appearance. And the Steelers, it'll be their first shot at being on the Hard Knocks horizon, which typically Hard Knocks was going into teams that were on the downside looking for hope going into the season. Well, this is a whole different ball of, ball of wax. This is going to be them following these teams as they go through somewhat of a gauntlet of an NFL season because that division is so good. Yeah, and you know what I really want to know is I want to know the uh, the winning percentage of all the teams that, ha- that have been involved in Hard Knocks. Like if you take all the teams that have been in- involved in that in that series, just their their win loss record. I'm curious to know to know what that is. I mean, just off the top of my head, I would imagine it's somewhere in the three to four hundred range based upon the season before they were on hard knocks because mm. that that has always been kind of the criteria yeah they they go into the training camps that are looking for those reasons for fans to pay attention to that team yeah absolutely and uh, basically air all their dirty laundry if you will <laughs> yeah. uh, for the entire world to see and there's always that like that that hard knocks curse right um which is funny because I feel like if you do a hard knocks uh, season on an entire division, you kind of break the curse because, well, one of you guys has to win the division, right? Yeah, something's got to happen. Something's got to give. I mean, unless they just end in a tie. <laughs> Everybody ends in a tie. Yeah, yeah. If, who knows? Uh, <clears throat> but is there... Is there something in the NFL that just has us so enthralled that we would spend our harder money to watch something like this as a nation that it seems a bit redundant, don't you think? Yeah, but you know, it's the off season. I mean, people people are desperate. I mean, we love people love football. Americans love football. And when when the season isn't going on, they're going to find any way they can to uh, to consume uh, f- football content. Yeah, I mean, for goodness sake, we had the Longhorn Network down here in Texas, <laughs> and we what did we watch for probably five years straight? Oh, it, it was the national championship game against USC. <laughs> we we watched it all the time, but we also had uh, other content that. We would show like other old games, some behind the scenes stuff. And that's really what I see this Hard Knock show as being is uh, just something to kind of feel our craving to know what it's like. Like on Netflix, they had that quarterback series, what it's like being a quarterback. Well, what's it like being part of these teams during the season? And I'm interested to watch it. I don't know if I am going to subscribe to watch it, but I'll find a way that I had to get it on my television somewhere. And speaking of games that we want on our television, 
the College World Series is down to its final two. And David, I know you got some thoughts to on the two teams that have made it through and how they got there. I'll give you the floor. Yeah. Well, you know, when you look at a – I mean, I'll, I'll start with Texas A&M because they eliminated my team. Um, they've been doing it with uh, with pitching. Um, and uh, they're the first team uh, since – are they the first team since South Carolina? Well, I know that if they if they win the College World Series in, in a sweep, they would be the first team since 2011 South Carolina to uh, to go 10 and 0 uh, in a, in, a, in a postseason run. Um, but you look at, you look at the Aggies, Ed, and it's basically next man up for them. You know they've lost uh, they've lost some of their best guys, including Braden Montgomery, but it, it hasn't mattered. Um, I mean, as I said, they've been doing it with uh, pitching. I mean that guy Lamkin. Uh, Justin Lamkin, I think is his name. I know his last name is Lamkin. He he just completely uh, shut Florida down. Like he just shut all of our batters down. Um, well, maybe maybe not Cags. I don't think he shut shut Cags down. But as a whole, he shut our uh, he shut our offense down. So you know, kudos to him and kudos to Jim Schlossangle as well. Man, you know, uh, just all the times that he led TCU to the College World Series, and now he's leading Texas A and M. Uh, to the College World Series and potentially their first uh, uh, title ever in, in baseball and their first major title since 1939. It's been that long. Well, then you look at a team like Tennessee, who they've been doing it with everything, man. They've been doing it with uh, with hitting. Um, I think I saw a stat that said that they're the first team ever to have, I think, four, four or five. I want to say four players hit 20 or more home runs. You know, they've been doing it with pitching. They've been doing it with uh, – defense uh, they're the number number one overall seed and obviously the the big concern for them was well it doesn't matter how good they are they got the curse number one seed so they're not going to do anything well ed let me tell you um this just feels like tennessee's time you know pretty much every team that made it as a number one overall seed i i dismissed them except for the couple of times that that my gators were the were the overall number one seed you know obviously but other than other than my team this is the first time that I can say with confidence that, yeah, the number one overall seeded team is going to win. I mean, we talk about Texas A&M's injuries, right? And, you know, kudos to them. They've, they've been able to overcome it. But I just don't see how they're going to be able to uh, overcome it against a uh, against a juggernaut like Tennessee. Um, I don't know, man. This just feels like Tennessee's year. I mean, it just does. Well, being a Texas guy – Texas root for Texans. It's just what we do. <laughs> I I have no dog in this fight. I uh, I actively root against Texas A&M when they're playing my Longhorns, but it's we're siblings uh, in the end. So I'm definitely looking forward to seeing Texas A&M uh, continue that streak of number one seeds not winning the <laughs> tournament, especially since. Uh, Texas was the last uh, top seed to make it to the final, but they didn't win. Yes. So to have Tennessee take over that title from us, I'm more than happy about seeing that <laughs> uh, for sure, especially going into the next season. And we'll, we'll have that whole argument of which is the real UT. So that's that's been going on for a couple of years now, uh, especially in our circle of friends. So uh, with Texas A&M, I'm with you as far as how they've gotten here. It's been not just the pitching, and I know we keep harping on this, but it's the patience and the striking on the base pass that they just they don't let up. And it's it's something that if you give them an inch, they're gonna take two or three bases from you and you've got you can't do anything about it. So I I'll go opposite you. I'll go Texas A and M. Uh, I won't. I won't actively say the the phrase uh, for the Aggies, but <laughs> I'll say uh, do a good job. That's that's <laughs> all. I'll, all I'll give them on that one. Yeah. Um, now, just as a follow up to something we talked about a, f- a few uh, weeks ago, I want to say it's been a couple months actually. Uh, the uh, Kansas City. Uh, uh, Kansas City had a vote that was voted down to add money to their stadiums 
uh, for the Royals and the Chiefs. And it looks like there is a possibility of them actually crossing the border over into Kansas. They are talking about that, and uh, they're talking about adding $3.5 billion into a fund to help build stadiums for both the Chiefs and the Royals on the Kansas side of that border. And if it gets in front of the governor, they're in favor of it. They'll sign off on it. So I'm really interested to see the goings-on for that uh, and the goings-on for any of these uh, other things that we, we've we talked about this evening, such as the uh, the future of this NHL Stanley Cup, the future of the SMU uh, Mustangs, uh, how hard knocks, what kind of information you can get on a week-to-week basis from there, and see who's going to be hoisting the trophy at uh, Omaha this week. Uh, if if you all out there want to comment to us what your thoughts are on any of those, please feel free to do so. Uh, David, do you have any parting thoughts? Yeah, it will be really in- interesting if SMU ever wins a, a national uh, championship in football. I, I don't I don't think there has ever been a team with the horse name. I mean, that's key there, right? I don't think there's ever been a team with the horse name uh, win the national uh, championship in football. I know Oklahoma's, you know, won it a few times, but and then and they have a horse mascot, but they don't have a they don't have a horse like name. So just a random thought that I thought about. That's that's interesting. I I'd have to go back and see how many horse names there actually are on Division One, because uh, <laughs> that seems very minimal. Actually. Uh, I- SMU might be the only one because, you know, Boise State doesn't play in a power for conference. So un- unless there's an, another another team that I can't think of, I think SMU uh, might be the uh, the only team with the uh, with the horse name and the power four. Yeah, because I'm, I'm thinking about it. Cowboys is the closest thing uh, to to having horses in the logo. Yeah. And that's Oklahoma State. Yeah. Uh, and I don't see them winning the uh, national championship. I. At least this year, I'm not going to say ever, but at least this year, I don't see them uh, competing for it uh, as we move into uh, the next decade of conference realignment and how the shifting sands of college football finally land. Dude, I think I, I actually had Oklahoma State uh, in my, uh, you know, in, in the playoffs a, a couple years ago, and they looked they looked like they were about to make it, and then they just totally crapped the bed in the end. <laughs> I find that with Gundy's teams, it's always that one game. There's one game that they have no business losing. Right. And they just don't show up. Yeah. It like they're still out in the out in the field in the wind farms. Yeah. Uh, messing with the turbines out there. Like who like there was like just over ten years ago, um, they were the number one team in the country for for a good portion of for you know, for a good part of the season. Uh, who was they, I know they had Justin Blackman at receiver. Who was the quarterback? They they literally I think that was Whedon. Yes, Brandon Whedon. Which fun fact? He was twenty eight years old. The Oklahoma State had a twenty eight year old at, at quarterback. Well, so did Florida State when they won a national title. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, with Chris Winkie. So fair. Uh, but that's all continued uh, conversation that uh, we'll talk about. Feel free to talk amongst yourselves as well. But while you're doing that, please like and subscribe. And uh, for David, myself, for Matthew, we are rounding third and we are headed for home.